At this point, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker to you. How many people do you know who have been full-time freelance writers for nearly 50 years? How many people do you know who have sold at least 100 stories written and sold to the Reader's Digest and probably hundreds upon hundreds more over those years to the major magazine markets? How many people do you know who have written a book with Marilyn Monroe and another with John Wayne, uh, Billy Wilder and others? We, you'd think with somebody with a track record like that, they'd be old and tired right about writing. Well, this is not the case. We have a gentleman today who has a zest for writing, yet, with all those years, and I've asked him to come talk to us today uh, about that to share with you. In 1971, I asked Maurice to come to Mills College, the California Writers Club Conference, to speak there, and he did. And when I picked him up, he kind of shocked me. He said, but I gotta have a copy of Playboy. And I said, well, you know, to each his own. Okay, so we stopped, we got a copy of Playboy, and he's rifling through it, going right for the heart of it, right? And he went right by the centerfold to his article. And I thought, wow, isn't this great? And the point is, it was an article that appeared in print on the drug absinthe. Uh, Hemingway uh, had used that drug. And he said, look at this. This is an article. Um, the symbolism is that it points out 30 or 31 years as a full-time freelance writer to the month. And I thought that was unique. And that was in 71. And of course, here he is now 16, 17 years later. Um, I think he qualifies with those years, that track record, to speak to us about the agony and ecstasy of being a freelance writer. I bring you, and warm welcome with me, if you will, to Mr. Maurice Zolotow. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Randall, Bud, fellow writers, aspiring writers, would-be writers, and just plain human beings. Uh, I'm really, really glad to be here because I, and I love to talk about writing. I love everything about writing. I love everything about nonfiction writing, the, the conception of it, getting that gleam of I, the excitement that comes with getting the phrase gleam, the beginning to do the research, interviewing people if you have to interview them, making phone calls, and then the part where it kind of marinates for hours or days or weeks sometimes, and then the fruition and uh, the ri actual writing of it, and finally the sometimes gruesome process of going through edi edi editing, and then the glory of publication and seeing your byline. After all these years, I still get a big charge of doing all these things. My greatest pleasure is still the sheer act of writing. I can be depressed, disconsolate, suicidal. Well, if I sit down, <laughs> if I sit down at the typewriter, just putting my fingers on the keys sometimes is enough to bring me out of it. It's a, it's, it has always been a totally transcending experience for me. And that goes back to when I first discovered I had this vocation. I never had to choose should I be a writer or not. Be, I never had any conflicts. Writing was just thrust upon me. I don't have parents that were writers. They were, there wasn't a book in the house, although in their youth, I believe they had been bohemians, radicals, rebels, but it had gotten lost in the process of the... <laughs> uh, now, now, now to get to my two clarifications that have to do with the brochure, uh, it states there uh, that I'm, uh, or it lists all the magazines I write for. Uh, I don't write for any of them now, currently, except two. I write regularly for the Reader's Digest, and, I write and I'm a contributing editor and a regular writer for Los Angeles Magazine. Now, let me tell you a Reader's Digest story, quite recent. Um, about four and a half years ago, almost five, I decided to, s I suddenly, for various reasons, felt I better stop smoking or I'll die. So I stopped smoking, I went cold turkey, and I went crazy, and after a couple of weeks, somebody said, hey, listen, you're killing it. You're really climbing walls. I here's a guy in Santa Monica. A few people are meeting at his house, and they're kind of helping each other stop smoking. So I got the phone number. I went to this man's house. There were six or seven of us. We drank Perrier water, ate popcorn, and helped each other stop smoking. And ultimately, after a few months, that 
became a big meeting and we got a meeting place and we decided to call ourselves Smokers Anonymous, patenting after Alcoholics Anonymous. Now the years go by and this is, I just love this group, I'm part of it, and I tell my editor at the Reader's Digest, Dan O'Keefe, I say, I want to do an article about Smokers Anonymous and my experiences. He said, please, Morris, don't do it. He's always getting me off these things, so not to waste, he doesn't want me to waste weeks of my time without an outline, a formal outline, a proposal, <laughs> and I'm always saying, I want to do it. And he said, now this is insane, because we have run more articles about every aspect of cigarette smoking before the Surgeon General's report 30 years ago. I said, Dan, I got to write this, I just have to. And uh, we love each other, but he, he's, you know, he sees it that way. And uh, so he, I t uh, so I went ahead and began interviewing some of my fellow people and putting, putting this thing together. And he then sent me a computer printout of every article <laughs> that the reader, with the date, the author, and everything. Not to write this. He wants to help me out. He's a good, kind human being. He loves, he loves me. And, and did I pay attention to that? No, I just said, because my principal, I was looking into my heart. I have the right to please myself. See, I'm not trying to please Dan O'Keefe. I, I want to. I'm not trying to please the editors of the Reader's Digest. I want to. I must, in a sense. And I have to, but I just, it doesn't, it doesn't affect me that much. It's I and God, maybe, who, who I most, I'm a, when I'm at the typewriter, I'm alone. It's me and a piece of paper. There's no editor there. Nobody has to know how many drafts I make. I never tell them the blood and sweat that goes into it. Anyway, I wrote the article, and I sent it in four days later. Four days later, not four weeks later. Four days later, I got a call early in the morning. It's three hours later out there. But I get up early, about 7, 7.30. It's Dan O'Keefe, very excited. He says, well, that article is beautiful. It's been bought. And four editors, are, issue editors, are fighting over it to put it in their issue. <laughs> so there you are. So I'm not, that doesn't mean that you should all go out and say, well, tear up your outlines. I'm not saying, but I'm just saying, that's how I have lived and that's how I work. Still, the article appeared in the April issue, April 1985. I'm not talking ancient history of 40 years ago. 1985, April, Reader's Digest. We, we took a little box in Santa Monica and we asked those who wanted more information to write in. To date, we've gotten over 6,000 letters. We ourselves paid for the postage to give them information. As a result of that article, there are probably at this moment maybe over 100 Smokers Anonymous groups. That single thing I did is probably the most valuable socially from the point of view of helping people of anything I've ever written because most of my work has been entertainment pieces about entertainment people. Some have been charming and some have been important historically. I wrote the first book on Marilyn Monroe that everybody has drawn on since, but we'll talk about that in my seminar and other things. But, and I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't followed my star. Look, to thine own self be true. That's what counts. If you're really in this thing for a market to make money, I'm not the man to listen to. Leave right now and go get a cup of coffee because I, I just do it. If it happens to, it's like a man is growing avocados and nobody wants to, no, no, no retail people want to buy avocados. He's got to love avocado trees so much that he's going to grow them anyway and wait for people to develop a taste for avocados, which if they have any sense, they will eventually. <laughs> Now, my second thing is about books. It states there, at least my latest book correctly, is Confessions of a Racetrack Fiend. It says it's now in bookstores. It's not now in books. It was published by St. Martin's Press. It came out about 84 or 83. And I have brought 10 copies that are alone. And I'll tell you how I wrote that book. I su suddenly got an obsession with going to horse races and racetracks. I never, never had been a better, never went to tracks, but through Doing, writing something about Walter Matthau for the Reader's Digest. It's a long story which is told in the book. And I got this weird obsession. All of a sudden, I'm going to the racetrack every day, San Anita, Hollywood <laughs> Park, Del Mar down in, uh, near San Diego in the summers. And sometimes I win and sometimes I lose and I get a computer. I write an article about a couple of these things for Los Angeles magazine. I always write about things I'm currently involved in. And uh, this computer, using it, I had some 
And then I began losing. And one day I had a terrible day at Santa Anita. And as I was driving back in a heavy, rainy day, I said, I'm going to write a kind of a funny book about a loser at the track. And I don't write these kind of books. People are used to biographies of John Wayne and Marilyn Monroe. That's my style. But I had to do it. There we go again, you see, as to quote President Reagan. I just had to do it. I wasn't going to ask anybody. <laughs> hey, listen. I didn't, I didn't call up my agent. I didn't even have an agent then. I don't like agents, but that's another story. Uh, I didn't call, because they give you advice I don't want to hear. I didn't call up my agent and say, listen, I got a great idea for a book on a guy who goes to a racetrack and loses. Can you imagine how much enthusiasm I would have gotten with that book? Yeah, the public is waiting for that. Of course, write it immediately. I'll get you a six-figure advance. But listen, I can understand people who are writing to make money, and they want six-figure advances, and they look at what the bestseller is, and they write it. And they often produce best-selling books, and they get very rich, and they're happy. I don't believe that great wealth produces poverty, and those who like <laughs> I produces, I mean, produces misery. <laughs> Great wealth produces poverty. Now that's a brilliant, that's a real Marxist statement, isn't it? Well, actually, it's not so stupid because it often produces poverty of the soul, but that's, we don't want to get off into morality here. But I'm not in that group. Let's face it, Donna, I'm not. Uh, I've made lots of money and I've spent lots of it foolishly, by the way, and I don't want to get into another digression, but. So I started writing this book without asking anybody but me. I consulted myself and Go ahead and do it, I said to myself. <laughs> and I did it. And I loved it. I, I tell you, the thing I love most about writing is as I sit, sitting down at the typewriter, just me and a typewriter, it, it doesn't beat everything in the world. It certainly doesn't beat ecstatic moments of making love to a woman you love who loves you, or when your children are born. They're a great, uh, or the, your first trip to Paris, uh, your first trip to Italy. I just made that last year. I mean, the, Florence, I don't mean Florence, a girl I once went to bed with, I mean Florence, Florence, a city in Rome where they have great paintings, you know, like Tintoretto and other people that you dream about seeing. But as a continuing thrill, the act of writing in itself, not as a means to, and not to get money or to pay the rent or to put food on the table, just as a pure act, a consummation in itself. So I began writing this and having a ball. And, and, but still going to the track. And in the course of this, one morning I went to the track with two friends in, in Hollywood Park. That's in the book, too. And I said, I have a feeling we're going to hit the pick six today. And if we do, I want the ticket made out in my name, the check made out in my name, because I'm going to put it on the back jacket. And I told him this. And it happened, because I felt I had at least three winners. It happened, we did hit the pick six that, that day. We did get cash in for $38,000, minus tax, it was $31,000. I've made more writing, by the way, and big coups, but that wasn't bad for a, an afternoon. <laughs> uh, and but once we won, they didn't want this to happen, because they had ways of gimmicking around and not paying tax on it. But luckily, I held the ticket, and I ran and got it photostatted, got the check made out in my name. By the time they caught up with me in the cashier's window, it was too late. So I had it reproduced, and it's on the jacket. All that vision came true. That I, can you imagine if I called a publisher and said, uh, listen, I, forget, I can't remember the editor of St. Martin's. He's gone now. The editors come and go. As I, my daughter is a writer, and somehow she has bad times. I say, Crescent, don't worry. Editors come and editors go, but the writer remains. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> anyway. Well, as I call about, and I have had, been very good friends with several publishers and writers, and, and I said, listen, how about a book about uh, hitting the pixels? Said, you know, they tell you crazy. It's not for you. Let Dick Sharp write. Said, they put people into niches. Anyway, so I wrote the whole completed book. I had no outline. I had no advance. But God damn it, I had a hell of a lot of joy. So you can't <laughs> buy that. But those of you that get joy out of yachts and diamonds and having mistresses or masters, whatever the female, uh, where are the romance writers? What is the, what is the female equivalent, if it's a kept man, what do they call him in romance books? Fun. What? Rich. What? Rich and fun. But I mean, no, where the woman keeps the man, the reverse of the man, gigolo. gigolo. Yeah, gigolo. A gigolo. Gigolo. So, I mean, if, you're, if you dig gigolos, fine. If you're writing to get a gigolo, 
right? I, I don't write for these purposes. I just write for the fun of writing. So this is terrible advice, and as soon as this thing ends, forget it, leave it, and follow, <laughs> follow the counsels of sane, rational people, and do outlines. So now that I've got that clarified, we can get on, now my talk begins. <laughs> well, we're doing pretty good. <clears throat> I'm gonna try to cover about 47 years of professional freelance writing in 10 minutes. Uh, let me tell you how it started. I was about 12 years old. I was going to Montauk Junior High School in Brooklyn. As I say, I came from a background of, of where nothing, there wasn't one book in the house and nobody talked about writing. They talked about just making a living and the labor movement maybe. And, and uh, I can remember from the beginning, just at, words themselves fascinated me. I can still remember the first reader we had either in kindergarten or first grade, these funny, bright reds and greens and yellows that they had, and the words had a physical sense for me. And I believe, in a deeper sense, writers, by, if they're that by nature, uh, words have the same kind of resonance for them, let's say, that sounds have for the person who'll be a musician someday, or that colors begin having for the person who has the endowment of being a painter. I happen to have a son who's a gifted mathematician. Uh, we could see, and he, has, he had two parents who were terrible in that area. We could see from the beginning that numbers made music for him. I mean, you just, it's there. If you have children, you see these things. I very much believe in genetics and heredity. And uh, I have great, uh, the environment does not play as much influence as some current thing could sink, but who cares? That's, it's, I've just, I've watched my children. Anyway, uh, it was that way with words, and at age 12, we were learning English in the school, and the assignment was to parse sentences. In those days, I used to do that. And, uh, and she said, write a few sentences about your favorite pet. And I st we didn't have pets in the house. And so I made up a dog and began, I don't know what, how I did it or why, it was my first experience of the transcendent vocation that had been given to me by some power greater than myself because I lost all track of time and place and my head, you have these funny little pens with nibs and you had to dip them into ink wells. There were funny little oak desks. Only people who are very old will remember these. And I dipped it and I'm writing. Now the rest of the class was done and they're all, nobody said, I didn't know I was in the class. And when I finished, I gave it to the teacher. Her name was Miss Fiducia, and Miss Fiducia looked at it and looked at me and said, you wrote this? I yes. And I said, yes. And she said, you're a writer. That's it. <laughs> my, my destiny. I never had to see a guidance counselor, and I never. <laughs> my parents we thought this was crazy. As a matter of fact, when I was engaged to marry Paul's future editor, Paul probably hadn't even been born then, my mother took Charlotte, the future Charlotte Zaladau, into a private room and said, for God's sakes, this son of mine is crazy. He's head over heels in love with you. Could you please talk him out of the idea of writing? Can't make a living from that. And Charlotte said, but that's what he wants to do, and I think it's wonderful. And, uh, I didn't say my mother crossed her off her list, but <laughs> little, little, did, little did my mother know, as I used to say in romance books, little did she know that someday uh, there would be a writer named Paul Fleischman on the same bill as the husband, future husband of this Charlotte. So life uh, gives you strange combinations. And anyway, we will now cut to 1941. Prior to 1941, my first job after college in the Depression, I couldn't get a job on any New York newspaper. I want, I, my career plan, start out in the newspaper business, like Ernest Hemingway, and, become a, uh, and then ultimately become a novelist like Ernest Hemingway and, or F. Scott Fitzgerald, and go to Paris and live on the left bank and have a French mistress. <laughs> or somebody, another fantasy was John Reed, if you saw Reds. Uh, I, so I was a radical and I admired John Reed and Louise Bryan. Women, the three women I hoped to marry, not those actors, but a woman like them. She would have the qualities of Louise Bryan, free spirit, free love, and so forth. No marriage was in the plans. Another one was Isadora Duncan. These have all been, have had movies made about them, but you got to remember, I was a bright kid of, in 1927. I had it figured out. 
And another one was Emma Goldman, now the, the famous anarchist. I read their autobiographies, I knew all about them. And that's what I wanted, an anarchist woman, political rebel, a free lover, a uh, wild dancer. As a, and uh, instead I fell in love with a quiet, soft-spoken Southern lady at, whom I met at the University of Wisconsin in a class in French lyric poetry that I was auditing. I wasn't even, by then I was reading for honors. And it was just love at first sight. And she was very proper and very prim and was total, totally disinterested in politics. Bought one newspaper in her entire life the day they announced the draft numbers in World War II to see how my number was. Doesn't follow current events. And uh, we had a f rocky but fascinating relationship for many years. But it didn't, so life does not work out according to schedule, which is a further proof that don't bother too much with outlining your life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 so, uh, and I had gotten, I had gotten fascinated. Oh yeah, I couldn't get a job in any paper. Uh, and then I began writing to magazines. I started with the A's in the Red Book. By the time, before I got to the B's, I had four or five inquiries. It was very hard to get jobs. And I accepted one from the Billboard, which was in a big fat magazine. Not the music magazine it is these days. Then it covered all aspects of show business, including carnivals and circuses. And, and I was accepted. I got $10 a week to start. Charlotte took shorthand and typing, and she got a job at Harper and Brothers, now Harper and Row, as a stenographer and doing drudgery work. Uh, those are the things you did. And ultimately, she became a vice president. And after she divorced me, she, um, that is, she became a vice president. Her career shot up. She now has her own logo. And among her authors, of whom she's most proud, is Mr. Fleischman here. So those of you who are married, women, you might well consider a divorce. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a valuable, it's a, it can be a terrific career opportunity. But, uh, it's bad enough I'm against outlines, now I'm against matrimony. But it's a, what a, no, I'm just kidding about marriage. Maybe not. <laughs> so uh, I had gotten, uh, gotten very, very interested in jazz early on. Oh, it must have been, I was seven, 16 or 17. I just loved jazz. And I began collecting the records of Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington, all people that are famous now. At that time, they were either uh, people who, the, the, it, when I went to college, the more sordid element that we intellectuals consider the more sordid element, the jocks, they, they liked jazz and dancing and they went out to dance halls. But the guys I, the, the poets and writers, by the way, the former Senator Hayakawa was an assistant English instructor in the faculty at Wisconsin and he helped us put on the first uh, American production of uh, Murder of the Cathedral, the play by T.S. Eliot. Every time I mention poetry, I turn to our poetry person here. Like Madame Sassastris in The Wasteland, she has a bad cold. Those of you who know The Wasteland, anyway. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite poets. But anyway, uh, we, they didn't even like movies, and I love movies. And uh, so I had to go to movies with people who were in fraternities and women who were in sororities. And so I had my jazz love. And I was the only guy on the billboard who knew anything about swing bands and jazz and wanted to go up to Harlem. So they, they used to review all these things. So I was the only guy who was willing to go up to the Apollo Theater and the Savoy Ballroom. And I, so I was there in on the birth of all this. Now remember again, I was following my desire. I didn't, nobody assigned me to go up there. They were just glad there was some idiot <laughs> crazy enough to go up there. And I gave Count Basie the first review he ever got in the billboard. And when I came out, his mentor, John Hammond, whom I never knew, came to the billboard to ask for me. John Hammond is a discoverer of Bob Dylan, more recently, and Bruce Springsteen, the boss. And John Hammond and I have been friends since this review came out in 1937. He's still living. Came up just to thank me and meet me. And he and I began going around to jazz clubs. Okay, now we cut uh, and then in time, I became a press agent. I did everything. Every time I made, got a $50 together, I quit my job and started writing. And I, I'd get rebuffed. <laughs> and I'd have to take another job. And, I, and finally, a wonderful strip teaser named Margie Harder, a uh, 
She was one of the clients. She said, look, why do you work for 20 clients? I'll pay you what this guy's paying you, 50 bucks. Just work on me. I think she had other motives, but we don't want to go into that. <laughs> this is going out on television, and uh, who knows? But she's now married to Councilman Ferrero in Los Angeles, as you know him. Anyhow, I did work on her account, and that gave me a lot of time to write. And one morning I got up. We were then living in a very small walk-up, three, three, three flights up in a, a grungy section of Manhattan, $32 a month rent. I think Charlotte had then become a reader in the children's book department at Harper's. And I couldn't sleep, and I woke up. It's 5 AM, and I start, again, this mysterious force. I began typing on this little old Smith Corona. And I, it was a story about the Savoy Ballroom, and Chick Webb, and Duke Ellington, and dancing the, the Lindy Hop. Ella Fitzgerald, a tisket, a tasket, was a big hit then. The ink spots, how the ink spots were discovered. They'd been porters and so on. That was what, now, remember, if I had read the Saturday Evening Post, if I was studying the market, I wouldn't, I don't, well, I, if I was studying any magazine, I would not have written this. Because in 1941, no, no national magazine wrote articles about black singers and black musicians, period. No, N-O, capital. Washington, D.C. was a Jim Crow city. Believe me, I know you're going to doubt it, but take my word for it. Duke Ellington, who became a friend of mine, could not eat in any restaurant in New York except a Chinese restaurant. Think about that. But that's another story. We don't want to get it. So would I have written this? No. I'd get to see what they're writing, and I'd do the same thing that, that was being done there. And I'll tell you a secret about magazines. They may tell you what they want, and they may tell you what their market needs are, but they really want something they haven't got yet, that they don't know till they get it. Because if their market needs are to do a wonderfully well-written profile about a movie star, they're going to come to me or somebody like me. There are a dozen people who are experts. And so it goes. Find your own, look into yourself and write. Anyway, I wrote this thing. It was a long article, 6,000 words. And I didn't know what to do with it. And I showed it to my wife and future editor, not my future editor, his future editor. <laughs> and she said, this looks pretty good. And she found out an agent through her connections at Harvest. I took it to the agent. And he read it over a weekend. I called him Monday. And he said, I'll either give it to the Reader's Digest or the Saturday Evening Post. And the next thing I knew on Friday, a fellow named Charlie Buchanan, who kind of ran the Savoy Ballroom, calls me and says, there's a photographer here named Peterson. Says he's from the Saturday Evening Post. Do you know anything about it? I said, couldn't be that, because I didn't know how fast a magazine can work if they want something. And uh, I went up to the Savoy Ballroom. It was June 26, 1941. It was Charlotte's birthday. That's how I can remember the day. And by Monday, I had a telegram from my agent saying the Saturday Evening Post had bought it. So how can I believe in, in anything but the divine inspiration that is motivated? I gave you just two incidents. I could go again and again and again how I came to write about Marilyn Monroe. Every publisher I talked to said no. Remember, it was 1960. Marilyn Monroe had not, committed, had not died either through suicide or an overdose. She wasn't even married to Arthur Mello. I, when I began trying to convince people to give me an assignment on Marilyn Monroe, it was 1957. And she was just, no, just another dumb blonde starlet. And so I did it on my own, another case. And it's become, today you have to pay a lot of money to get a first edition of that book in mint condition. So uh, I'm going to conclude now because it's time for me to end. That's the only reason. And I, <laughs> I, uh, so all I can say to you this morning is when you hear the other words of wisdom and sage advice and practical suggestions, good. Consider them. But also consider that the greatest riches that you have are within, within yourself. You are unique. You are the only one of you, of you that God ever made. And I know that whoever you are, you have something good to say and good to write. And I hope this conference will help you get it on paper. And God bless you. <laughs>